You know, as we're, we're only, guys, we're only three weeks away from the new biblical year of 5776. And we'll talk more about what that means. But part of what it means, I believe, is that it's going to be a year of connection. And out of that connection, there is a fullness that God is wanting to bring. And when I think about the fullness God is wanting to bring, I know many of us have been given uh, a destiny, have been given promises from God, have been in the, and those promises contain his purpose and his plan for our life. And, you know, many of us have only seen small or partial fulfillments of these purposes and plans that God has called us into. And kind of the analogy is in Deuteronomy, it says 26.1, it says this, Deuteronomy 26.1, it says, Now when you have entered the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it. And the question that we have to ask is, when have we fully entered into the land, and when have we fully possessed the land and the promise that God has for us. And one of the things we have to understand is partial entry is not complete entry. Having part of the land, which in this case we're saying part of God's purpose and plan for our lives, having part of it and not the whole is not fully possessing it. To fully possess it, we need to apprehend and lay hold of all of it and, and like Israel, God is calling us to take possession of the land, to fully enter it. Let's enter into the promises and the places that he has prepared for us. But in order to take full possession, we need to know the spiritual keys to taking the land. And I believe these keys come in the form of questions for us. If we're going to fully do what God has called us to do, these are the, some of the key questions to becoming his disciples in a very specific way for our life. Now, some of these things are things we talked about before, but they're always good things to be reminded of. It's kind of as we come to the end of the year, let's review and think about a little bit old things we've talked about and some new as well. And I believe the first question that we have to answer when we're thinking about entering into the promise and of taking the land, many of us want to go straight to the question of how. God, give me the strategy. I want to know how to do it. I want to know what I need to do in order to make this thing work. And I believe God is first and foremost not interested in the how, but he's interested in the who. God is more concerned about your who than your do, as our good friend Mary says, right? You know, it's kind of like what I sh I've shared the story before, but, you know, when I was on my spiritual journey and I met this girl, Joanna, the first love of my life, and we're walking in the mall one day, and she, they have a sale on diamond rings. She says, Jason, if you love me, let's go look in the window. So we go look. And she says, if you love me, you'll buy me a ring and get engaged. I said, I've got no money. She says, don't worry. I'll put it on my credit card and you can pay me back later. <laughs> and I said, yes. And we got engaged. And her family were believers. She was the first person to really witness to me. I had no idea what they were talking about. And uh, she's like, Jason, we got to get a date to get married. I'm like, I got no job and no money. She's, don't worry, my, my stepfather drives a New Jersey transit train, and he can get you a job as a ticket taker. One day you can work yourself up and become a conductor, and we'll be set. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I was like, at the same time, there was an opportunity for me to 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 take a job in a recording studio in New York City. And what happens? I decide, do I have to decide between the girl and the job? And I decide on the job and not the girl. <laughs> and I felt like the Lord's, and I, and I knew at that point, I learned a lesson from that. God, you know, if you don't know who you are and what you should do, someone else will be more than happy to define you and tell you what to do. The first question is always who? It's the question of, who am I? 
who has God created and called me to be? And often we struggle and, you know, with, with that question. And it's kind of like Moses. Moses grew up and he learned two songs. He, long, he learned the songs, the song of his mother, which was the song of the Hebrews. And he, long, and he learned the songs of Egypt. And when he grew up, he did decide which song was he going to sing. Was he going to sing the song of royalty of the Egyptians, his adopted family, or was he going to sing the song of his people? And all of us have to make that decision in life. You know, song, it's like music has order and symmetry. It implies purpose and order. And all of us have to decide what is the primary song we're going to lead? What, you know, what, what are we, how are we going to live? Which, is, which song are we going to attune our life to? And he was created, he, was, he, was, he, was, he had become a prince of Egypt, but he was also part of Israel. And the question is, which was he going to do and he makes a decision. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his people, the Israelites, and he saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. And Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Listen, if you try and be someone who God has not created you to be, you become an errant soul. Trying to, fulfill, trying to fulfill somebody else's destiny and calling other than your own is like trying to make bricks without straw. There's nothing more difficult and nothing harder to do. And all of us are going to have parents or friends or spouses around us who want to tell us, who know, believe they know what's best for us and know what we should do. And the challenge is to be faithful to who God created us to be and called us to be even when others don't recognize it at first. Moses knew he was called to do something for his people. The problem was his people didn't see it. Here he is. He's the prince of Egypt, the lap of luxury. And the question becomes, he, he's willing to sacrifice everything for his people, and then his people turn around and reject him, and he's got to go shovel sheep manure for 40 years and be out in the desert for 40 years. You can imagine there's some days, you never wonder, maybe Moses said to himself, did I make the right decision? I could have been in Egypt. I could have been in the palace, and this is where I'm at. Until so God meets him at the burning bush one day, and it all becomes even clearer. There were two, you know, in Eastern Europe, Jewish people used to love to go to what's known as the Schwitz. It's the bathhouses. And one day, this guy, Yassel, goes to the bathhouse, and he didn't have a great memory. And so he really struggled to remember things, and he was kind of foolish, and he was kind of terrified. He goes, you know, I, I know who I am by my clothes. Everyone looks the same naked. He goes, what happens when I go to the bathhouse and I take off all my clothes? Maybe I'll forget who I am. So, I have, so, he, so he thought, what could he do to remember? So he decided to tie a red string around his big toe to make sure he wouldn't forget who he was. And so he, he's having a great time. He gets out. All of a sudden, he looks down, and he has got no red string on his toe when he comes out of the bath. This other, he looks over and he sees another guy there and he's got the red string on his toe and he goes up to him and he says, I know who you are, but can you tell me who I am? I know who you are, but can you tell me who I am? And so many, so many of us are like that, right? What are those strings in your life that you have allowed to define you? You're not your job. You're not, you're, you're not, you're, your value doesn't come from your job. It doesn't come from who you're married to. It doesn't come from what you have. Those are all strings. Strings can come and strings can go. They're not at the essence of who God has called you and created you to be. And if we define our lives by those strings, we become inauthentic. To be authentic, it means that you dare to be you and you don't try and copy somebody else's style in breakdancing terms and b-boy terms. Bradley, don't be a biter, right? Don't be a biter. Don't bite someone else's style. Don't bite somebody else's moves. 
There will always be those voices in our life as we're struggling to become the who that will tell us that we're not good enough, we can't do it, and then we have to live in the state of denial, right? Living in a state of denial is good. When it comes to all those people that try and knock us down and break us down and destroy our dreams, we have to deny those negativities. We have to deny the lies that are spoken over us. Be careful who and what defines you. Don't allow others. Don't allow things. Don't allow our careers. The only one that should define you is the Lord and what he thinks of you and who he's called you to be. So I got a friend who's a screenwriter, and they've been working like eight years on this big movie. They finally have got some A-list celebrities attached to it. And one day she went to a party, and at the party she met Cindy Crawford. And they're talking and having a conversation. And she's, Cindy says to her, what do you do? She's like, I'm a screenwriter and a nanny. And Cindy says, that's a pretty big slash. <laughs> you know, we're all going to have those moments in our life. We're like, God, can I really do this? So the question first is who? Do you really, is it settled for you who God has created you and called you to be? That's the first question, Lord, to really answer that with him. It's an issue of identity. We've talked about this so many times. Identity is destiny. If you're not solid in your identity, everything else is being built on a house of cards. The second question is how? What are the spiritual components that we need to understand? And the foundation of the how always believes, always is based on this primary principle, it's faith. The key to taking the land is by faith. And we've talked about this in detail before. Twelve spies go into the land. Ten don't have the faith, and the two do. And because they lacked the faith, that generation had to die in the wilderness until there came the ten until there came a generation that did. And the question is, how can 12 people look at the same thing and 10 have faith and 10 have fear? You know, faith is a matter of sight. As we talked about last week, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Right? Helen Keller said, the worst thing is not to be born blind, but to be born with faith and yet have no vision. And fear will always come to rob us of our destiny and come to give us stage fright, whether it's fear of failure or fear of looking dumb or fear of people, whatever it is. We all have our own fears, and that fear wants to undermine our faith and rob us of the promises and keep us from being and doing who God calls us to do. Without faith, it is what? Impossible to do what? To please God. And oftentimes, God, you know, God is calling us to have more faith. And as we've said before, there's a difference between faith and trust. Faith is knowing something is true. And trust is faith in action. It's actually stepping out and putting it into practice. And the biggest problem is that we're, we're as believers, we're so focused on faith. It's like, do you believe Right? But oftentimes, God is not calling us to take a leap of faith. He's calling us to take a leap of action that demonstrates that we have real faith. If we're not taking some action that, that, that for God, then I'd say, what really is the level of our faith? Because faith always, put, all, faith always empowers us to do something to fulfill the promise and the calling it's so what Ephesians 2, 9 through 11 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. So the good news is, is that it's already been prepared in advance. All we have to do is have the faith to walk in it. It's not something we have to try and manufacture. You are God's workmanship. Created in Messiah Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the reason why we don't have to strive. That we can do it from a place of rest, 
because God has prepared it for you to do. Uh, Ephesians 2, 9 through 11. Ephesians 2, uh, 2, 10 through through 10 is the main verse. Ephesians 2, 10. So part of what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to be who we are becoming. And faith will always propel you into your destiny, into your future. Hebrews 11, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Messiah as greater value than the treasure of Egypt because he was looking ahead for his reward. By faith he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw he who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and application of the blood so that the destroyer of of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Faith, like love, casts out fear. And we need to ask God to increase our faith. We need, and we need God to increase our faith. We need to ask God, increase my faith for what I believe is impossible. Increase my faith and understanding of how I perceive you. But an aspect of faith is one of my favorite words, which we've talked about before, is chutzpah. Can you say chutzpah? chutzpah. That's a good Hebrew Yiddish word, chutzpah. chutzpah. Turn to your neighbor and say, you've got a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> so what is chutzpah? It's, it's, it's what? Assertiveness. Assertiveness. Unmitigated gall. Right? On the negative side of chutzpah, it's the guy who murders his parents and goes on trial and asks the judge to have mercy on him because he's an orphan. That's chutzpah in the bad sense, right? We don't want that sort of chutzpah. But it's that holy boldness. And the rabbis teach that the last generation before the coming of the Messiah is known as the generation of the heel. And I believe we could be that generation, that generation of the heel. Why are we the generation of the heel? Why is the generation before the coming of the Messiah in Jewish thought known as the generation of the heel? Obviously because we're in the heel or the footsteps of the Messiah. Okay, we're having some technical problems here today. All right, there we go. Because we're living in the footsteps or the Messiah. All right, there we go. But there's something more there. It's that as, as before the coming of the Messiah, right, some generations are associated with the head, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're associated with the heel. But why is the last generation associated with the heel? Because the heel is associated with chutzpah. Think about it for a moment. The first person who is called the heel in the Bible is Jacob. Imagine your parents name you the heel, the one who grabs at the heel, Yaakov. Akev is heel in Hebrew, okay? Because he so wanted his brothers, he so wanted the blessing, he tries to pull his brother back in. But let me tell you what, Jacob has chutzpah, right? You can imagine he tries to make his brother trade his birthright for a bowl of pottage. That's chutzpah. Then he dresses up as his brother and tricks his father. That's some chutzpah. You think you could actually get away with it, let alone do it. I mean, this guy's got some nerve. He's willing to do anything for the blessing. Even though some of it's misguided, he's willing to do anything for the blessing. And the generation before Messiah comes will need greater chutzpah, greater boldness, because there's going to be greater obstacles. And the truth of the matter is you're never going to accomplish anything great unless you ask God to put a little chutzpah in you. I mean, we're in Hollywood town. I don't know if you guys know who Brett Ratner is. 
But he's one of the top grossing uh, box office uh, producers, that directors that there is, right? It's number 16. And Brett Ratner started off in Miami, Florida, going to high school. He dreamed of becoming a director and a producer. He wanted to be in the film business. And so and he, he tried to get all of his teachers to agree to let him do all his assignments through making little movies. And his grades weren't that great because he was trying to get on set more than he was in class and studying. He was on the skate set of Scarface just trying to learn and just trying to hang out. And so he's getting ready to graduate from high school and he applies to NYU Film School. And it's his dream to go to NYU Film School. So he sends his application in and he gets the big fat rejection letter. So what does Brett Rat Ratner do? The guy's got some chutzpah. He gets on a plane. He flies to New York. He demands to see the dean. He barges into the dean's office, sits down, and basically says, I'm not going until you let me into the school. <laughs> and at the age of 16, he was the youngest person inducted, accepted into the NYU film school. His big break came after he met Russell Simmons, the hip-hop virtuoso. And he started to make music videos for Def Jam. Madonna, Mariah Carey, Jessica Simpson, P. Diddy. Then he went on to make Rush Hour, Family Men, X-Men, The Last Stand, and a number of other films. But let me tell you what, if that dude didn't have some chutzpah, he wouldn't have gotten to where he was. If you want to do some great things to God, you need to take some risks and do, have some holy boldness. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. If you're not willing to stand up as, and do something and take some risk, you know, and that's the point of faith. Faith, chutzpah is about the heels. We lead to, we stand on our what? Heels. And in the same way, we have to learn to stand by faith. And the essence of the heel is faith. The essence of chutzpah is great faith. It's not rashness. It's not like unmitigated gall. It's not audacity, although sometimes it is that, but it's not audacity in a prideful way. It's, 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 it's faith and chutzpah in the sense, I know God has created me and called me to do this, and I have to do everything within my ability and an opportunity to make sure I am faithful to do. And if God is calling me to do this, he might demand me to step out of the boat and do some things that look a little bit cray-cray to see if we're really committed to him. Right? If our faith doesn't cost us anything, if there's no cost, if there's no risk involved, if we just want God to do it, we, we sit back and play it safe, come on. So we develop a strong faith that can stand and persevere to the end. As Habakkuk says, the righteous man will live by what? Faith. Right? Habakkuk 2.4, Romans, Paul quotes it in Romans 1.17. The righteous live by faith. We live by faith, not by So don't be just focused on what's in front of you. Right? Chutzpah doesn't say, man, there's no door open. Chutzpah opens a door and it kicks it down. By the power of God, not in a striving way. Like Kutzma says, go take the land. They're like, there's giants in the land, right? There's no way we can take the land. Kutzma says, who cares if there's giants? God said, go take it. And this is part of the reason why Jesus says, Yeshua says, Luke 18, 18. He says, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find what in the earth? Will he find faith in the earth? Why? Because the context of that, he's like, you know what? Things are going to get increasingly challenging and difficult before he returns. The trials, the temptations, the challenges, the, the difficulties. And so the question is, when he comes, because of the delay in his coming, will we have faith? Because often when the things we're hoping for and dreaming for become delayed, what do we become? Discouraged. We become discouraged and our hearts become sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And we tend to want to give up, throw in the towel and be like, say, oh, I guess it wasn't God's will or God didn't make it happen. Or, but he's saying, well, who's going to be left standing? 
Don't let the delay and the doubt cause you to lose faith. Delay causes most people to doubt and to stop hoping for the deliverance. Delay often undermines our faith and causes us to deny our destiny and our dreams. But when we do this, we will never take the land or enter into the fullness of our destiny. Listen, a lot of times God delays our ability to go in and take the land, not because God is like, well, I want to see how long I can make him suffer. He's like, you know, playing a little game with us, a bait and switch or something, right? No, what he's saying is, you know what? You have to get ready to take it. And he's wanting you to grow and develop and be prepared to take it. And so during difficult times of testing and temptation, we need the strength of chutzpah to sustain us. And chutzpah is rooted in faith and trust that does not take no for an answer and that does not fear. Chutzpah like faith stands the chutzpah like faith stands up and holds God accountable to his promises. See, we, God wants us to hold him to his promises. That's some chutzpah. Right? Mary has some chutzpah when John chapter 2, Yeshua says, you know, I know the wine's run out, but what does that have to do with me? And she's not taking no for an answer. Whatever he says, do it. That's some chutzpah right there. God, I'm, you've said it, you called it, this is your will, I am not taking no for an answer. And we keep seeking and asking and knocking and saying and, and, and declaring his promise. And we say, God, we are going to hold you to this. You're not going to leave us nor forsake us. You are going to provide every need according to the riches that are in your son. I'm not going to live in fear. I trust that you're going to give me faith. And without chutzpah, we're not going to do anything great because chutzpah pushes and demands us to do something. It's like the first prime minister of Israel, Ben Gurion, said, he said, you know what? The difficult we can do today, the extremely impossible is going to take some time. It's not the question of if the impossible is going to happen. It's just a matter of how long it's going to take for the impossible to happen. wasn't doubting it. Chutzpah that is rooted in faith. Moses had some chutzpah to risk for the people. Yeshua risked for his neighbors. And we need to take risk for others. Cross some boundaries. Do some crazy stuff. Esther risked for the people. So we got to have some chutzpah to do the greater things than these. But of course, the balancing of chutzpah is always humility. See, chutzpah becomes dangerous when we don't have humility. If we balance those two things out, they're, 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 there's, there's, it's healthy. It can't just be boldness and brashness and you know, we've talked about this before. We, I talked, shared with you before about the, the, this dream that impacted my life where I was at a Hollywood premiere and all of a sudden the spotlights came on me and I couldn't see and I said, take the lights off me. And I felt God say to me in the dream, if you try and take my light, you'll become blinded. If you remain small in your own sight, you'll remain significant in mine. Humility is about it's about occupying the right amount of space. Too much, occupying more land and more space than God has given to you is pride. I want what's mine and I want what's yours. That's prideful. But there's also a false pride to saying, oh, woe is me, I'm a worm, I'm a nothing. I can never, you know, I can never do it. That's not, that's just being foolish. You should call and be, if God calls you to a platform of, to speak to millions of people, it's not pride to step onto the stage and to do it. It's false pride not to. And if God calls you to impact the lives of 100 people, then you know what? That is, that's, to impact one life is a great thing. And to try and not be satisfied with that and say, you know what, I want... A million when God's given me a hundred. You know what? Humility says I'm happy with God with what God has given me. 
And kind of the way that we keep this balance, you know, one, one rabbi had a suggestion. What he did is he kept two notes in his pocket. In one pocket it said, I am dust and ashes. Right? From the dust we come to the dust we go. In the other pocket it said, the whole world was created for me. And that's the truth. As we say in Hebrew, the emes, the truth. The emet. The emet. Yes, you know, you are dust and ashes. You're not all that in a bag of chips, on the one hand. On the other hand, God thinks you're the best. And he created all this for you. And he would have created it for you if you were the only one. And to keep that perspective and to keep that balance, to have that healthy understanding of who God created us to be, that identity in him is key. And then there's, there's, chutzpah, there's faith, chutzpah, humility, and then there is walking in the favor of God, and Hebrew ratzon. When you look at the life of someone like Moses, he had great favor on his life. When you look at the life of someone like Joseph, Despite everything that he went through, he had great favor on his life. And it was that favor that came from the presence of God being with him. People recognized that God was with Moses in a very, and he was with Joseph in a very unique way. The fa- our favor always comes from God's presence. It's like Yeshua had great favor with the people like during his ministry, Yeah, partly because he was healing them and feeding them. But because, no, there was something about him that people were drawn to, that people felt connected to. It was an intangible. You couldn't quite put your hand on it. As it says, and Yeshua grew in wisdom and with favor and in stature with God and with man. He grew in stature, he grew in wisdom, and he grew in favor. And we need to grow in favor, but we have to understand favor always comes through the presence of God in our lives. That's why he went alone to be with the Lord. And so it's kind of like, you know, the Psalms, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? You know, what? that Psalm was actually designed as they brought the Ark of the Covenant up from the house of Obed-Edom into Jerusalem. That's what they sang. Psalm 24, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? He was clean hands and a pure heart, right? You know, the, the earth is the Lord, is the fullness thereof, Psalm 24. And it's actually said that, at, that, 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 Psalm, that as they sang to go up to the hill of the Lord, that, that the, the, the gates of the temple were super heavy. It took multiple people to move the gates of the temple. They were so thick and heavy for protective purposes of all the stuff that was in the temple that literally the gates opened on their own supernaturally because the favor of God, the presence of God went before them and the gates supernaturally opened. See, when God is with us and his presence is going before us and we're walking in his will, we don't have to push open the heavy gates. Right? God just, he opens the door for us. It's like the Red Sea. Chutzpah is having the faith to step into the sea even when it hasn't parted. But it's the favor and the faithfulness of God that parts it for us and brings us through. You can't force the door open. But when you step out in faith and the favor is there, then God, then the door opens. And the thing about favor is, number one, favor is not fair. (laughs) Some people get favor in certain areas and there's no rhyme or reason to it. But we should rejoice when others, when they have it, And the truth is, favor can rub off. Right? I mean, you you know, you spend time with people who God is working in and through, some of that's going to rub off. Some of it's going to provoke you to do some things. And, you know, there's, there's a struggle and a process along the way. But we also have to understand that part of this as well With this favor, part of where favor comes from 
part of where the presence of God comes from is that it says that God dwells between the distance between two faces. Where does that idea come from in Jewish thought? It comes from God dwelling between the faces of the cherubim on the ark. It's the idea behind where two or more are gathered in my name, there I'm going to be in their midst. There's something that happens in the context of relationship, in the context of community, when it comes to the presence of God and the favor of God. One can put a thousand to flight, but two can put how many? Ten thousand. It's the idea of Ecclesiastes, two are better than what? One, because they have a greater return for their labor. If the either falls down, the other one can pick them up. So the point is, you cannot enter the land if you try and walk in and do it alone. There's only one way to do it, and that is doing it together in the context of relationship. You know, when there's 12 tribes, right, some of the tribes get it on one side of the, of the Jordan, the others have to go into the other side, but the commitment is this, that we won't settle our side of the Jordan until we go in and help you take yours, See, we're so busy fighting for our dreams and our promises that we stop to, we, we, don't, we don't think about the person next to us. We don't think about the person around us. And the truth is, God isn't going to send someone to serve your dreams and calling until you serve some others first. And so they had to fight together. If they didn't fight together, they were not going to take the land, fight for each other's inheritance. And think of what we could achieve if we were really committed not just to our own success, but to seeing each other succeed and to be everything that we can be. It's the difference between Babel and the book of Acts. Babel, they were trying to make a name for themselves. The book of Acts, they were trying to make a name for God and the kingdom. And that's what we got to do. It's that, it's that what we've talked about before, that John 21 moment where he wants to give us the nets that don't break for this great catch that's coming. But for the catch that's coming, we have to join nets or else what we have will not sustain, will not hold. And part of what this means is that we have to move from me thinking to we thinking. It's not about me, it's about we. And it concerns me because I think certainly in our culture there is a preoccupation with me. We talk about the me generation. It's all about me, right? It's about my selfies. It's about my, how many fans I've got. It's about, you know, I got to look perfect for, look how good my life is and look what I, you know, everything is good. My life is falling apart, but on Facebook, look at my perfect life, right? Everything's a, mo- uh, a selfie moment. And the reality is that even the, I suck, struck me this morning, just a little thing. You know, even wealth begins with the word we. Because true wealth is about relationship. The one who's rich is the one who has a relationship. The only thing you can take with you in this life is relationship when you go. It's not about net worth, but about your network that's key. And it's about moving from a personal preoccupation to a corporate one. Like even in our theology, we become so individualistic focused and we talk about, you know, we talk about, we talk about salvation in primarily individual terms, right? Like what, you know, like, you know, am I saved? Am I going to heaven? Am I... You know, I got you know, to get, but the truth of the matter is when Messiah gives a great commission, he's talking about discipling who? Nations. He's talking about whole nations being discipled. He's talking about whole communities, whole groups of people, whole mountains. You know, we're focused upon our personal gifts, our personal calling, and God is wanting us to move from individual to community. Even when I was talking with Pastor Jonathan, and, he, and we got into this discussion, and he said, even when it comes to sin, it's all personal. Like, we think about, 
the, the worst sins are like, like morality sins, like, you know, sexual sins, or we just saw that with the Ashley Madison thing and all these guys being outed and crazy stuff like that. But the truth of the matter is, biblically, you know, the greatest sins, you know, well, let me put it to you like this. Let me ask you this. Let me tell you two stories and see what your conclusion is, and we'll close in a moment. There's two major judgments in the book of Genesis, in the beginning. One is the Tower of Babel. The people want to build the Tower to Heaven. They want to throw God off His throne. Part of the reason they want to build the Tower of Heaven is they've heard about the flood and they're not going to get flooded out again. <laughs> right? So they're going to build it high enough so they can't be flooded out. So when they try and build a Tower to Heaven to overthrow God on His throne, what does God do? What does he do? He confuses their languages and scatters them. In the days of Noah, God wipes out the entire earth with a flood and he's grieved that he made man. And what was the sin that they committed that he wanted to wipe out the world? They committed what? The people were doing what? They were committing violence, Hamas, against each other. So let me ask you a question. Which, according to that, does God take more seriously? Sins against him and idolatry or sins that we commit against one another? Don't get me wrong. Both are serious. But we can't hurt God. But we can hurt one another. And let me tell you what. I'd rather have you, if you came up right now, if one of you guys lost your mind temporarily for a moment, you got really mad at some heresy that I preached, and you got up and slapped me in the face right now and walked out, I would turn the other cheek. Now, in the past, I was like a gang guy and a martial arts guy. Would have, I was hoodie. That would have been the end of you. Not today. I'm a gentle guy. I try to be. But let me tell you what you walk up and slap my child in the face? Let me tell you what. You better run as fast as you can because I'm no telling what I might do to you. You put a hand on my wife. You better run for your life. Right? You hurt the people that I love and you hurt the people that are in my life that cannot defend themselves because they are defenseless, you hurt them, you will not only, that is the greatest hurt you could put on me. And if God is a father, why is he any different? If God is a father and his greatest love is the children that he created in his image and likeliness, then how we treat one another matters. And too many times we settle for the lesser, meaning like, it's good enough not just to be mean. It's good enough just not to do something that's harmful. Like, you know, I might think like, hey, I'm really spiritual because like you said something really nasty to me and I turned the other cheek, right? But the radical thing is to turn around and bless you and to love you and to do good for you. So not just doing bad isn't good enough. Not being neutral isn't just good enough. Being there for one another is what God wants. And it's kind of like, again, it goes back to favor and it goes back to taking and entering into the promise and the destiny. That's who God calls us to be. People are valuable. They're made in his image and likeliness. And part of our responsibility is help restore that full image in them. And it's kind of like when you look at the life of the story of, uh, the story of Esther, right? I mean, everyone thinks Esther is the hero of the story. But the truth is Esther would have never entered her destiny if it wasn't for who? Mordecai. Mordecai. She was scared. She had fear. She didn't have the faith to go before the king. What if he doesn't extend the, stend, extend the scepter? I'm dead. Off with my head. I'll end up like Vashti. Na, 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 na. Hey, hey, hey. Goodbye. It's all over. And Mordecai's like, yeah, but for such a time as this, 
Maybe that's why God's put you there. Now, who had a greater position in the palace, Esther or Mordecai? Well, Esther did. She's the queen. But here's the thing. Mordecai only got to becoming the second most powerful person in the Persian Empire because he served Esther. Because he pushed her into her destiny. Because he was willing to raise, because look, he raised her from a child. He poured into her. And because when she entered into her promise, guess what? He entered into what? He entered into his. And here's the reality. Let's just be honest. The odds are overwhelmingly stacked against you to take the land. The odds are so bad against you that there's almost no possible way that you can ever take the land. But here's the truth. We're not in a fair fight because God doesn't fight fair. And because God is on our side and he's in us, because God is scary good, that even though we face fortified cities and giants and the odds are spiritually stacked, the odds are stacked against us, the odds are always spiritually stacked in our favor, it's not a fair fight because God is fighting with us. God has promised to be with us. Let me tell you what, you got God on your side. It's not a fair fight. Goliath, who cares about Goliath? He's small time. So, yeah, it can be frightening. It can be scary, but we've got a secret weapon. It's the Lord. So fighting takes faith. There's real obstacles. There's real dangers. There are real challenges. But the good news is we don't face them alone. We face them with the Lord, and we face them with one another. If we move from me to we, to the degree that we do will impact the land and enter into our destiny. It's kind of like one of my favorite movies of all time. Maybe the greatest trilogy ever to be created, Lord of the Rings. And the question is asked by Celeborn, what now becomes of this fellowship without Gandalf? Hope is lost. Gadriel. The quest stands upon the edge of a knife. Stray but a little, and it will all fall to the and will all fail to the ruin of all. Boromir looks back at her, unsure. Gadriel, yet hope remains while the company is true. Yet hope remains while the company is true. As long as the fellowship remains strong, hope remains. As long as the relationship stays strong, hope remains. As long as we have brothers and sisters that are on the journey and on the quest with us, hope remains. It's like the business author Frank Lencioni, who wrote a book, great book, Five Dysfunctions of the Team. He said, he, he opens his book and he says this, if, if, if you could get all the people in an organization rowing in the same direction, you could dominate any market any industry, in any competition at any time if people are just rowing in the same direction. If that's true in business, how much more is it in the kingdom? The problem is in, in, in the boats that we're rowing in, we're standing up, there's one person rowing and everyone else is yelling at each other which way they should be going and how they should be doing it, right? So in this season, we're called to get in time with what the Lord wants us to do. We're called to row together, know who you are, know what your place is in the boat, have the courage and the strength to even get in the boat and start rowing out to sea and, and have the chutzpah to just start on that journey, even though you don't quite know where you're going, but you know the general direction that God is calling you in and know what boat you're supposed to be in and who's supposed to be in that boat with you rowing and get in sync 
and start rowing for the sake of the kingdom and watch what God does. So, Lord, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for this promise. We want to thank you for this new season in which we are all going to be rowing in the same direction. And so we just love you and we thank you. And I want to pray that you would put a new holy chutzpah within us a new spiritual audacity and a boldness to not take no for an answer, but to believe in order that we might receive. But first, allow us to see who you created us to be and what you're calling us to do. May we not have the chutzpah and the faith for things that are the, the dreams of men, but may we have it only for the dream of God, your dream for our life. We thank you now in the name of your son, Yeshua, our Messiah. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. May we never allow anyone else's red strings to define us, but may we always be defined by you. We bless you now in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. We ask that as we are three weeks away from heading in this new year, that we would take the time to reflect on these questions. Who are we? What are we called to do? And how are we going to have the spiritual tools necessary to get there? We bless you now in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, in Jesus' name. Amen.